Okay, so it's recording. And for anyone who wants a transcription, you should be able to see it um, on your screen. If it's not there, it should be in your setting somewhere. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. So uh, just to uh, introduce everyone uh, on this Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Faze. Uh, if you came through Meetup or our HubSpot uh, or email, uh, I would have been your point of contact. So uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all. And um, I apologize for some of you. I may have accidentally mentioned this is a C sharp workshop. This is not C sharp. It's actually a data analytics workshop. So I apologize for that mistake uh, on my behalf. Um, but yeah, so I'm a part of the marketing team here at Scalespire, and I'm uh, very happy to introduce to you two of uh, Scalespire's newest uh, team members today. Um, and so we have Alfonso, who is one of our newest data analytics instructors. And we have Monica, who is uh, going to be uh, mentoring a lot of you guys uh, going forward. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Alfonso and Monica give uh, quick introductions about themselves just so that you guys can get acquainted with them. And um, I will after that, we will take it away with the presentation. So Alfonso, why don't you go ahead? Uh, thank you, Pace. Oh, thank you, Pace. I'm, I'm, also, like you mentioned, uh, I'm from originally from Costa Rica. I moved to the US something like nine, 10 years ago. And I, I have a PhD in statistics and data science and public policy. And I've been working doing data analytics or programming one way or the other for something like 12 years uh, in different areas. Some of these uh, not areas that are traditionally related to data analytics, such, such as social policy, such as economics. So I think it is a, it is a very interesting combination that sometimes gives you a, a wide view of, of the field. So yeah, very excited to be here. Very excited to share with you. Monica. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica, and I have been a developer for the last five years. I've been an instructor for that same amount of time. I um, mean, myself, I came from retail for several years before getting into full time development. So um, I really understand a lot of the pain points um, for new developers getting into the field. And I've worked with people at every level of their development career. So I'm just happy to join the team and I look forward to working with all of you and mentoring everyone. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to let Alfonso uh, take it away with the presentation. Uh, in the meantime, uh, for all of you who are here, um, if you would kindly, if you don't mind, uh, feel free to enter your emails into the chat. And uh, what we want to do is we want to reach out to you and uh, set you guys up with um, free coaching calls, career coaching calls, uh, so that we can help you guys figure out uh, an ideal career path for you and the appropriate steps that you would need to take to basically embark upon that those paths. Um, this is a service that we offer to uh, you know anyone who's interested, um, and it's completely free, so no charge to you guys. Uh, it's just to help you guys out. Um, a lot of times when you're figuring out whether you want to break into tech, uh, it's very confusing because there's so many different paths and sort of subsets of sex that you can go down. And uh, depending on what your previous experience is, what your skill set is, uh, what your even your personality and your tendencies are, um, certain paths may be more appropriate than others. So that's really the goal of this is to have our industry experts reach out to you and speak with you and uh, help guide you down the path that is best for you. And it's, all, it's always best to have it being said from someone who's been there and done that before to avoid all the confusion and any wasted time. So uh, if you're interested in that service, feel, please feel free to enter your email into the chat and we'll reach out to you, um, giving you the link for that information. Uh, but without further ado for now, I will hand it off to Alfonso. Thank you, Face. And I, just a question, how much time do I have? Just to make sure that I stay within the, the boundaries uh, you should be good if we're staying within 45 minutes or so. Okay, yeah, I think I'll, I'll definitely take much less than that. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're good. And also, uh, I hope you can see my presentation here. Um, I also wanted to say, if anyone has a question or a comment or something like that, uh, feel free to interrupt or raise your hand. I'm, I like these types of conversations to happen in two ways so that I'm not just me talking for a long time. So feel free to just uh, engage at any point if anything's not clear or you would like to discuss something in particular, your experiences or anything. 
anything else. And yeah, so basically uh, this is a conversation about data analytics. And of course, what we need to start with is a definition of what data analytics is. And so basically there are two components in the way we understand data analytics. The first one is a description and summarization of data in a way that us as humans, because we, we, we uh, sometimes write and do things as if the computer was going to interpret them and forget the fact that it is just normal people uh, just looking at those data and trying to figure out what it means. So the, there's a description and summarization component about the data analytics process that becomes very important. What is happening? Where it is happening? When is it happening? How it is happening? And then there is an analysis component to it that gives us an idea of how it might influence the future. So this is the second component of data analytics where basically you're not only seeing what happened, but you're trying to predict, you're trying to project what will happen in the future. And this is the more interesting part, right? Because the description is just basically what's out there. The projection is where you have a bit more agency in figuring out different scenarios or finding out what types of projections work better and what happens if you change a little element of the projection or the model or something like that. So in my experience, a lot of the work in data analytics ends up being in terms of seeking how to influence decisions that are going to affect in the future, but of course uh, supported by a description of what is what is currently happening. And in one way or the other, of course, some organizations, especially the larger ones, especially in tech, already use data analytics as almost a, a comprehensive part of their practice, but other organizations are starting to do it. Other organizations do it without knowing. Uh, I've had uh, experiences with, uh, for example, Little RV Park in Utah, where they said, we don't do data analytics at all. Uh, and we sat down with them and we, we went to the, to the front desk and they had this massive notebook where they had absolutely everything written out in the cleverest way I, can, I, I, I had ever seen. And they were making all types of projections and all types of accommodations of, of the services from guests from the RV park. They were just doing it by hand. And so then eventually they translated that into, into Excel and they translated that into more analytical tools. But the point is that sometimes they, or in many cases, people don't know they're doing analytics, but they actually are, and not necessarily through the traditional, through the traditional means. So yeah, most organizations do some sort of data analytics. And so I put this example here so that we can somewhat go over it and just kind of like uh, pick our brains a little bit on how how it works. And this is the composition of clients for a touristic company in Florida. And so this is basically the address of where those clients are coming. And so it's interesting because just by looking at this map, uh, most of you and we all start thinking, oh, this is very interesting. So you have a lot of people coming from the New York area. You have a lot of people coming from Florida. You have a lot of people coming from, from Texas. Uh, not many people coming from the West Coast. And so this is exactly what the description does. This is the description component of saying, well, what's out there, what is happening, uh, and how does it reflect in the, in the composition and distribution in space or of time, et cetera. There's an example here, uh, and, and I want to stress in, in, in this, the importance of doing this type of exploratory analysis before any type of model, because you will also find, and at some point you become very adept at detecting irregularities in the data, because data is not always fully clean. Uh, and so in this case, what we notice here is that the largest circle was in Delaware, in the middle of Delaware, which is a state of less than a million people. And so when we looked at this, we, we went over with them, try to figure out what is going on. Is there a, a major cluster of uh, clients from Delaware who just happened to go to Florida all the time for this, for this organization? And eventually what we found out is that the, uh, they were using the Bank of America credit card zip code and Bank of America is located in Delaware. And so it was showing the data that we had was showing that so many people were coming from Delaware, but it was actually just because the zip code of the, of the payment was uh, registered there. These were, these were not people from, from Delaware. So it is interesting to observe the data and just find these regularities and find some of these anomalies. This is kind of the game. This is the entertaining part of doing this. And this is the description part. In terms of the analytics, 
then we would look at a map like this and then we would think of, OK, what happens if we implement a marketing campaign in New York, in the state of New York or in the East Coast? Or what about Boston? It's a major market that is somewhat similar to the New York market and it is not as it is not as it's not being tapped as much as New York. So then you start thinking about different scenarios. What happens with the Midwest? Can we do something more in the Midwest? What about reinforcing local uh, customers? So then the analytical prediction part starts thinking about different scenarios, start thinking, starts thinking about different interventions, different things we can do with the data and model it to observe some of the outcomes. So that is something of a summary in terms of, of the concept of data analytics. And some of the uh, components of this presentation are going to be not super connected, but I, what, what we want to give you is a brief overview of the different uh, uh, pieces in play in the whole context of data analytics. And so I call this uh, other section employment outlook, but you can, you can call it also industry context or what is happening in the data analytics world and why everyone is talking about it. Why is it so attractive right now? Why everyone wants to get into tech? Why all the companies want, want to use it? And so in terms of the job market, everywhere you will look, you will find that there are so many uh, companies looking for data scientists, people looking for software engineers. It is the number one most sought up job in the US. And then some companies have predicted that there's actually a shortage. Uh, in 2021, there were 250,000 uh, companies looking to fill up these spots and it was just not, not possible. And so this basically becomes a very attractive career path for people who want to locate themselves in tech and look, locate themselves in the data analytics world and are just looking for also a way to, to leverage that with the fact that, well, we all need a job, we all need to, to, to get paid, we all need to pay our rent and our, and our mortgage and our, and our credit cards. So it is also a good combination between such a fun field and a field where right now there's a lot of demand that is there's a lot of growth there's a lot going on and so in that sense it is a it is a good combination and also in terms of work-life balance we always talk about how millennials or centennials or younger people are not necessarily looking for the highest paid job but more of a well-balanced uh, lifestyle and so in that sense data scientists have a very good work-life balance is one of the uh, professions that have the best work-life balance and its combination with like well paid with good salary and many openings so in that sense it is a it is a good intersection of areas that make it very very attractive especially for people who want to pivot or change their career paths or get into a new field this is always a good opportunity and it is not as hard to get into it as you might think so in many cases uh, it is it is very possible and so in that sense data science and and this is always something that it's, it's funny when someone in a in a restaurant or a friend or someone asks you well what is it that you do what it, and then you tell them well i'm a data scientist and they say well what is that and then the question is do you have 20 minutes to go over what is what it is because it's 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 many things and many people in data science come from many different backgrounds it's it's a very interesting field but i think the best way to explain it is as this intersection between math between computer science and between domain expertise math as much as it is very intimidating for a lot of people it is a good foundation most of the data science models and the analytics use math it use numbers but it is not like you need to know the smallest depth footnote of the equation of a model to implement it. It is just that it is founded. The foundation is based on math. And then, of course, the same with computer science. It's all done with algorithms. It's all done with, with programming or with uh, different types of software. So there is an intersection there. But I think the most interesting part, at least for me, is the domain expertise, because this is the part where we all have something to bring. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I, I come from a social science economics background. And so in many conversations about data science where people are computer scientists or people are mathematicians, then I have this uh, differentiation in terms of, oh, I have this knowledge of how to implement data science, how to implement computer science and algorithms into social science economics projects. And there's other people who come from nutrition and they know a lot about food. And there's a colleague, for example, who is a biologist who does data science. So he has the domain expertise on biology. And that's in that combination where, where interesting conversations happen. 
And so data science is the intersection of all of those sectors, but of course it is a field in constant evolution. It is it is open, it is changing. Of course, it depends on the company. There are energy companies where, well, you need to have a lot of domain knowledge in terms of energy. There will be a nutrition company or there will be a hotel where you need to have a lot of domain knowledge on, on lodging and everything related to the touristic and services industry. So this changes a lot depending on the field, but I think it is important to hi highlight it because it just refers to the, how interesting the field and how in, mo in movement it constantly is. In terms of the tools, there's also a wide variety. The, it, this is, uh, in my experience, one of the most intimidating parts because when you're, you're seeing uh, job postings or you're seeing presentations or you're seeing companies do uh, interesting projects with data science, you will see so many, first, so many acronyms, so many names, so many brands, so many languages, so many softwares, and, and it can become overwhelming because you, you say to yourself, well, where do I start? And so it is interesting to observe that actually a lot of the tools in the market, there's many, but a, a lot of the companies in the market use a similar set of tools. And so in that sense, a lot of people say, well, SQL might be the first place you want to start. Uh, learning a programming language where R and Python are uh, usually the ones that are mostly used in the industry. Excel, of course, is is the most used uh, platform, even if it's not necessarily programming. But in most companies, especially if you want to talk to people or organizations that are not deep into the computer science part, most people are going to do be doing their analysis through Excel. And it has its virtues. It's a great platform. It's a great way to find quick results and, and find in, interesting analytics. Uh, at your hand. And then you have many other different uh, uh, tools that, of course, are used by less companies, and that's going to depend on, on who it is. But it, from start, I would say that these are the tools that you uh, need to or are going to give you most salience in the in the data science job market. These are the most commonly uh, used languages in the sector. You will also find a lot of different names of titles. And so in that sense, there is a, an interesting separation between what we call business analytics and data analysis. They are somewhat related, but the business analytics part is more of the description component that I mentioned at the beginning. What is happening? How do we observe and visualize and present the results in a way that aids our decision making? Whereas data analysis is more handling the databases and of course building models to predict and to project what is going what is going to happen so in that sense even if you're going to see all of these different positions they do have some commonalities across them and if you have the tools it is possible that there will be somewhere there that you can fit especially if you combine that with with your domain knowledge and so these are also some of the some of the uh, job positions that you will see in more broader terms in terms of the generalist perspective you will see the data scientist which is uh, I, I like to say it as a methodology. You're thinking about data problems in a causal uh, analytical framework, whereas the data engineer is more focused on the design and implementation and construction of solutions related to data, especially da uh, databases and APIs and connections to different servers. And then the statistician is the more theoretical mathematician part where you're thinking about how to optimize different types of estimations that you're making. You're running a model that predicts uh, credit defaults uh, at a, let's say 97.1% uh, confidence or accuracy. And then the data scientist is going to spend, I don't know, 12 hours, I don't know how long, trying to figure out how to re how to increase that 97.1 to 97.0001. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, approach for, for those of us who, who enjoy it, but it also shows that there is variety in the types of activities and the types of relationships that occur in the world of, of data science. So from, from the job market, from the industry outlook, I would like to go back a little bit into the levels of analysis so that we can have more of a, of a discussion in that sense. So this is a model uh, that is presented by a company, Gardner, who is a, a trailblazer in, the, in terms of data analysis. And it just basically shows uh, two axes, one of value and one of difficulty. And basically the different type of analysis that companies tend to do and how it relates to that value and that difficulty. And so this descriptive analysis is the one I was saying at the beginning that is the, the description of what is happening 
right now, for example, the map that I showed you of the US. This is the easier one to deploy because what you need is the, the, the data points and then you just need an interface to just deploy it. Unfortunately, it just doesn't add as much value to organizations. It is very easy, it is very quick, so in that sense it is very helpful, but it is not going to add as much value as say something like a prescriptive or predictive analysis that is going to inform management decision making in the future. But of course, the predictive and prescriptive analysis are much more difficult to implement. This is where the data science component of designing uh, tools to predict the future come, come into play. And so I put this example here just so that we can, uh, uh, if you folks want to pitch in, uh, have a, a discussion about how to relate the prescriptive, the descriptive, and the predictive analysis into something like this. Uh, and this is uh, an example of visitation at a touristic company uh, in the US. And so in terms of descriptive analysis, well, this is already something of a descriptive product. This is already telling us, well, there's there appears to be some seasonality in the visitation where more of the people visit in the summer, which makes sense, which uh, we tend to know how it works in the US where uh, Florida has uh, great weather. And then in the summer, people from the north, from the Midwest and from the East Coast are going to visit a lot of Florida, just try to run away from the from the bad weather. But then in the predictive part, in the modeling perspective, then we can start thinking about where what happens if we try to optimize this. What happened in 2020, July 2020 compared to July uh, or summer 2019 that changed uh, this? What decisions did we make? How did those decisions affect? Was the cause of those decisions the marketing campaign we, we, we implemented? Was it COVID? What was it about this relationship that we're finding this increase in, in customers. Why is July of 2021 so bad compared to July 2020 and July 2019? Is it COVID? Is it something else? Is it uh, bad reviews on Yelp? Is it what is going on and how can we come back into a scenario where we have more visitation in, in the summer? So this is basically a, a, a one minute brief about how to think about the descriptive and the predictive components of the analysis. Of course, the description is easier. The description, we just have it here and we can observe and we can make decisions based on this. And the prediction, predicting how to move this back to this is of course going to be much harder, but of course it's going to add a lot of value to, to decision makers, to, to management, especially in the organization. And so as a summary, uh, data analytics does provide estimates about the likelihood of a future outcome, that prediction component that I was that I was mentioning, but we also need to be aware of some of its limitations. And uh, this is something that is a conversation that is always important to have, where we need to always be very clear that no algorithm first can predict can predict the future with any sort of certainty. No algorithm is perfect, and no algorithm should entirely substitute human decision making. It is a tool we have. It is a very powerful tool. But in many cases, especially when thinking about uh, ethical, what we call ethical machine learning, it is very important for there to be sometimes a human uh, just validating and making sure to follow up with some of the decisions that are made. Because otherwise, uh, and you've seen in the news, uh, I'm sure many different reports of, of what happens when an algorithm goes rogue and starts uh, recommending crazy things on Google, or when a Tesla vehicle is trying to make a decision where to, whether to crash or not, or whether a marketing company is sending people recommendations based on the predictions and turns out they are awfully wrong. Uh, even with courts in the US, we've seen them, uh, especially if there was a case in Kentucky where they were using an algorithm to try to define whether they would give bail to people and just using the algorithm. And then, of course, that led to very racially uh, uh, unequal uh, bail bail declarations. So that was a, a very uh, big case in terms of how to avoid algorithms reproducing some of the inequities we have in society. And so in that sense, it is important to always have that human, that human com component. So yeah, the data analytics is used to forecast the future. Uh, it is based on probabilities. And this is an example of what is the probability that Harry Potter will not pay back his loan. Like I mentioned, we, we try to implement models to predict default, to predict whether people are going to pay or not, or something like the weather, which of course is a very complex system where we have so many variables and you will always see in your app that it says that tomorrow is going to rain and then it doesn't rain. 
Uh, and that just shows the, the difficulty of dealing with complex situations such as nature, such as the weather. And of course, when we involve the human component to it, it becomes even, even harder. <clears throat> so I, I'm, I brought up this slide mostly to just show ver very briefly how the flow of data science projects goes. So usually you just, you just identify what the problem is and you will find that in most conversations, say with clients or with people inside your company, this is what they have. They have a problem and they're trying to figure out how to address it. Of course, there will be a data preparation and data exploration process with transformation and selection. This is what we would call the data cleaning part. This is a part where projects can get stuck for a long time because people have the problem. They think they have the data, but the data that they have doesn't necessarily lead to whatever product you're trying to get to. So this process can, can take a long time, but it is critical to be able to build a good model. A good model in, in theory, without the data, without the ability to implement it, it's really not, not very helpful. Then you build a model conceptually, you train it, you deploy it, you validate it. I'm sorry, you, you train it, you, you tune it, and then you validate it just to make sure that it is working in the way that, we, that you would expect and that it is providing helpful results. Then you deploy it, and then you enter in a phase of evaluation. Usually in this phase of evaluation, you will identify a new problem and then the cycle starts to repeat itself. So I just wanted to mention this just so that you can think a little bit about what is the, the usual flow of these types of projects. And so finally, uh, I just wanted to mention a little bit about what Skillspire does uh, in terms of how to get there. Okay, this is great. Analytics is great. It's a great job market. It's a very interesting field. It has a good combination of skills. So the question would be how, how to get there. And that's why uh, the, the data analytics course, and that's what the data analytics course tries to do in terms of how to acquire data. The section that I mentioned, that great model is, is, is amazing, but if you don't have the data, it just doesn't work. How to visualize, how to do the analytics descriptive part of the component, understanding the data and what constitutes good data. Using some of the tools that are most commonly used in industry that will be great for uh, for the job market, especially because a lot of people are using Excel, a lot of people are using Power BI, SQL, Python, and then to collect and analyze large large data sets, and then how to present those results in a in a in an effective way. Because you can have the best model, you can have the best results, you can have the best data. That if you don't know how to translate the results into business decisions then it, it is really moot. I've seen many cases where a, a very talented mathematician or statistician goes into a conversation with a manager, with a C-suite uh, person and tells them, well, uh, we, we, we decrease the accuracy in the ROC curve by uh, 0 0.001 with a 0 0.02 to 0 0.03 95% confidence interval. So that's great. And then the managers will be like, well, uh, like, how, how do you translate that into, into this business decision making that we're trying to make? So that combination or that translation of the data analytics part and speaking in the business language becomes a very, very helpful tool. And of course, that becomes professional development. And then, so here's a comparison between the different types of activities and the, and the costs of just going to school, taking a computer science degree versus the, the boot camp which is the program of, of Skillspire. And of course, there is a, a dramatic difference in terms of price. There's a, a difference in terms of how many people are involved in each of those. And this is, a, I believe, a good resource for you to, to just have and compare and use uh, the analytics to, to make the best decision that, that works for you. And this is, this is very similar in terms of the bootcamp is more accelerated. The curriculums are more iterative in terms of reinforcing the different types of uh, skills and abilities that are going to be helpful in the job market. It is less expensive, not traditional. And then in that sense, it is more hands-on, uh, less based on theory. And then it has the mentoring component that, that we mentioned before. Whereas in college is more sometimes theoretical, more research-based. Uh, and of course, it takes a long time in large classrooms where you can get the personalized approach that sometimes it's better for some of us who learn more uh, with working through problems with people. And then this is the this is the description of the of the course. I'm not going to go over this uh, very much in length, uh, but I, I will be happy and I'm sure the team will be very happy to discuss more in detail, but it is more just how it works, how the program is built, what type of activities would you be doing, how long it is and the, the focus of some of the of the activities in terms of software, in terms of the platforms, in terms of how the analysis is done. 
And then finally, like like Faith mentioned, uh, uh, feel free to just put your email in the chat, uh, just so that there, so that we can establish a, a, a bi-directional uh, channel of communication. Uh, there's also the the two certifications, one in Microsoft Data Analytics and Google Data Analytics. This too should cover, at least in my experience, something like 75% uh, of the market. Most companies do use at least one of these. Uh, and so in that sense, these are very helpful uh, uh, programs if you folks are interested. And then that will be it for the presentation. So we'll be happy to take questions, discuss, and just have a, an interesting uh, conversation with you folks. Awesome. awesome. Uh Thank you so much, Alfonso, for your very thorough uh, presentation. Um, I just want to mention a couple of points to everyone in attendance before we proceed with the Q&A. Uh, the first part is for those of you who were uh, not able to make it on time, that's completely fine. Uh, we have the entire workshop recorded. And uh, if you are interested in watching it from the start to the end, uh, feel free to enter your email into the chat and I will follow up with you after the workshop and uh, get that sent over to you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is someone had asked about um, other courses that we offered uh, involving like cloud computing and AWS, and uh, that is something that we do. And so in the chat, I've posted the link to all our all courses page. Um, so if you're interested in something other than data analytics, such as cybersecurity, uh, web development or software engineering, for example, um, feel free to check out the link that I have posted in the chat. Uh, the last thing I want to mention quickly before we move on to the Q&A is uh, for you know, typically with these workshops, what we like to do is we want to make it a very interactive and personable event for all you guys. And so one thing we like to do is for those of you who wouldn't mind, uh, you don't have to, but you know, if you feel comfortable, uh, if you don't mind unmuting, unmuting your mic and just um, telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, what interested you about this workshop, uh, what kind of compelled you to come and like, you know, where you are like in your uh, transition into tech or if you're already in tech um, so that we can kind of assist you and get a better feel for like where you are in your journey. Um, so if anyone would like to do that real quick, um, you know, the floor is yours to unmute your mic and or you can do it in the chat as well. It's completely fine. Hello, everyone. Hi, is this uh, Stania? Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So my name is Tanya. Um and I just got into tech. I mean, I'm not even in there yet. I haven't even got, I haven't even gotten started. I'm not sure which field that I want to go into. And I saw this link on a Facebook group chat that I'm into. And I was like, okay, I'd like to have more insight on data analytics because that is something that I think I would like to do. Um so I'm glad that I was able to attend this this meeting. And also I can't find a chat. Um, I don't know about it's not popping up for me. OK, uh, do you see a little kind of um, a bubble with two lines? Uh, it should be. In between the people icon and the reactions icon on the top for me, yeah, at I least. I don't have yeah. that because I have the app downloaded and I have used Teams before, but I only have the raise hand, the participation button and the end call. I don't have the chat. I tried to leave and come back in. I haven't tried to join from the website, but it's just not coming up for me. I'm not okay, sure why. See if there's like a three dots and then a more uh, option that pops up more. Um, yeah, sort of it's it's not there. Not there. Okay. Yeah, feel free to try and um, exit and come back, and I'll let you back in. All right. I'm gonna try again. Thank you. Sure. No problem. Awesome. Uh, so anyone else? OK, so I'm going to read someone from the chat. Um, so Joe mentions that he's currently trying to transition from academia to tech. He recently finished his PhD in economics. Do you have any advice or suggestions for where I should start? Oh, so Alfonso, I guess this is a great question for you. Yes, it is, uh, although I don't have a, a a clear cut response because it is certainly a hard transition. I would focus mostly on companies who are trying to do uh, an intersection between anything related to social science, such as economics and consulting. That seems to be one of the areas that is looking for more people in terms of uh, economics and 
uh, if you just go straight into like what I call hard tech, which is, uh, uh, I don't know, think Amazon, think uh, Google. I think a lot of the uh, of the benefits of your PhD degree in economics are just going to get lost because you're going to be focused more on the engineering side. So that would be something that I would encourage you to 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 think about. But it is certainly a process many of us navigate. It is somewhat messy, uh, and I would just say keep trying uh, and just try to find a reconciliation between your values and the interest on in what you do. And I'm sure you will find a company that has an alignment with that and, and that you will enjoy. But yeah, I, I wish I had a more straight up response, but I, I, it is messy. It is, a, it is a complicated market, but I'm sure you have the tools to, to get there. Well, that's OK, Alfonso. I have solutions for just this type of situation. Um, I myself came from retail before I got into tech, and that is probably as big a jump um, as the one that you're going through. Um, John, I think was your name. Um, anyhow. Um, a lot of companies, they want to see examples of your work. They want to know that you can do the job. So whatever path you decide to take, if it's um, data analytics or one of our other paths, have examples um, and have target companies that, um, as, as Alfonso mentioned, are an intersection of your past life in academia and your new life in tech and just have examples of your work that you are really into and can speak to and show off your skill set. So that would be my best advice. And of course, we can dig deeper. There's so many tips and tricks that I have for situations just like that. So we'll be in contact. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Alfonso and Monica. Um, anyone else want to, uh, you know, just um, chip in with their background and what their current um, career slash tech uh, outlook and path is looking like right now. I know someone's typing in the chat. You're also welcome to unmute um, your mic and speak up as well. OK, so here's a good one. So. Um, Suraj, he says that he's currently pursuing the Google Data Analytics certification and he is a graduate student in finance. He has good work experience in spreadsheets, but not with a tech background. Uh, his question is whether a Google certification and uh, combined with a couple of projects, whether that's good enough for an entry level job as a data analyst. So I think uh, Alfonso, I think this is also, um, or and Monica, uh, either of you. Um. I think that's a very good starting point. I know a lot of organizations want to know where you got your education from, whether it be a boot camp or something else. I think a boot camp um, looks really good on your resume when you start applying, um, just because they know you had a structured path of learning. Uh, you learn the most up-to-date things. You learn from somebody that had experience in the industry. So I think um, those three things are the three top things that are going to get your resume looked at and get you moved on to getting those interviews. Yeah, I, I just want to jump on that. And yeah, it, it does look definitely like a set of skills that you can, you can uh, you can make the most out of in the in the job market. And then just to go back into Monica's previous answer, you just have to find a way to link it to whatever it is the company is doing. How does that knowledge will inform and make you good at your job in that in that organization? So as long as you have that, uh, I think you definitely have what you need to 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 be able to be competitive. Awesome. Um, so Raj, I hope that uh, answers your question. OK, he says thank you. Cool. Uh, anyone else? Um, just want to, you know, anyone, anyone want some feedback or just some advice or just want to inform us about, you know, where you are in your tech journey, maybe to motivate or inspire um, some of us who are in this chat as well. I know everyone's like in a different stage at different times of their lives, so uh, it's it's always interesting to hear uh, where everyone is at this point in time and then reflect back later on to see how far they've come. So anyone at all before we move on to Q&A? Cool. 
Okay, so <clears throat> Bruna's asking, um, hi, I'm 30 years old. I've never worked in a company and now I started a boot camp. Do you guys think it's going to be hard to get a job using just a boot camp? That was a good question. A very common question, but it's a very good question. Um, Bruna, you were you are the same age I was when I started boot camp. I might have been 29, but same thing. Um, but I just want to say that's an excellent starting point. Boot camps, one thing alone isn't going to get you the job, but your boot camp, your projects, your resume, your LinkedIn, all those things are going to work together to get you your job in tech. So um, of course you can't just expect to go to boot camp, do your assignments there, and get a job, but there's definitely other things along the way that you can do that are definitely going to increase your chances and make you a more um, hireable candidate. You definitely need to have a way to highlight your skills and um, show off your work to your potential employers. Awesome. Someone says thank you. You're welcome. Uh, anyone else? Just in case anyone joined in late, uh, we're just kind of, um, you know, we're going around the room and everyone's kind of sharing their uh, current career path trajectory and what they're working on and, um, you know, how far they are into their tech journey or if they're just now getting started or considering getting started. So um, for, you know, anyone who's interested, feel free to post in the chat or you can unmute your mic and speak up. Either way is completely fine. We just want to hear about, uh, you know, where you are in your journey and, um, you know, help you out any way that we can. So uh, if anyone else is interested, just feel free to, you know, post it or unmute. You guys okay. are so quiet. I had so many questions before I started boot camp, so I I'm surprised you guys don't have a ton of questions right now. Okay, so right as you said that, Joe's asking, um, <clears throat> do you have any recommendations for boot camps? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Skillspire is a boot camp, so um, uh, <clears throat> obviously the obvious answer would be Skillspire. Um, <clears throat> What I would say is, Joe, um, where uh, where would you say uh, you are kind of in your uh, tech journey? Are you just getting started or um, have you already kind of dipped your feet? Um, where exactly are you um, in your path? Okay. Just getting started. OK. Um, OK, do you do you know uh, which career path you want to go down? The reason I ask is just because. Um, if you're just getting started, a lot of times it kind of helps to speak with someone and figure out uh, what might be best for you. Um, if you've already figured out, figured that out, that's all well and good. If not, I would look at the link that Yasmin sent above. Also, I'll be sending in the chat right now. Um, so basically what we do is we offer free one on one uh, career coaching and what this is basically for is to help you uh, figure out the ideal career path um, you know we'll talk with you we'll have our industry experts talk with you and um, we'll take into account your preferences your interests your educational history your skill set um, what your uh, aspirations are like pretty much we'll take into account all factors um, and uh, provide you with what uh, our opinion is on what might be the best path for you to embark upon. Um, so if you are interested in that and for anyone else who's in attendance, I mentioned this earlier in the workshop as well, um, but I reposted it in the chat for the free one on one career coaching. Um, definitely go to this link and sign up. It's 100 percent free uh, for you guys, and it's really just to help you. Um, you know, uh, figure out what you want to do, uh, because if you're just getting started, it's it can be kind of intimidating. Um, so, Joe, that's what I would say. I hope uh, that helps. If you have any other questions, feel free to follow up. But 
Um, I hope that helps you out uh, in terms of recommendations. We can get more specific uh, during that call than we can uh, right now because we can take into account context and things like that, which is very important. Oh, OK, cool. So Joe says it does. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Oh, right, so Yasmin asked a good question um, for Monica specifically. She's saying, what are some of the questions you had when you were starting out? Yeah, so before I, I went to boot camp, I wanted to know what were the type of things I would be building and how would that relate to a, a real job? And um, what I, you know, what I came to find out is um, you, you might be building small projects in boot camp, but those are the building blocks to build larger applications. Um, you know, a lot of times if you do it, you look up tutorials on YouTube, all you get is, you know, clones of other big sites or you get um, a to-do list, things like that. But how does that relate to what you're actually going to be doing? As long as you know that you learn the building blocks, the different components, then you can go on to build big things. So that was my biggest thing is how is what I'm going to learn in bootcamp going to teach me what I need for the job? So it's, it's an evolution. Um, you start off um, with smaller things and you are able to um, gradually grow and build larger things. And I know for me and my, and my boot camp, and I know here, um, there's a specific path that you go down um, to finish the boot camp, but there's also um, your instructors will be able to point you into the direction of things that are more targeted to your interest and your goals um, as you start applying you know, what's going to make you stand out. So that's a very, very individualized thing that you can only get from, you know, having an instructor that kind of knows your, your abilities, your work ethic, and your goals. Um, you don't get that from just doing a tutorial. You don't get that extra feedback. And another thing about boot camp that I really enjoyed was having that instant feedback loop. I could come to class and ask my questions and you don't get to ask questions from your YouTube tutorials or anything like that. So I think it's a, you know, I really was focused on getting a job after boot camp. Um, so I know that was a ton of my questions had to do with that. And I'm sure a ton of you have those same types of questions. And you can always ask us in your career coaching or, you know, reach out to us. I'll be reaching out to everyone later this week. So. Um, if you do think of something, write it down, put it in your notepad on your phone, and, and we'll talk about it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot, Monica. Um, anyone else with any questions, career insights? The floor is open to everyone now for Q&A. So if anyone has any uh, questions, feel free to um, ask away. I know someone's typing in the chat, so we'll give them a second. OK, so OK, so Alice says I'm currently doing a boot camp working for a SaaS company. Know a little experience about SQL and Python in terms of LinkedIn resume or interview tips. What can I do to transition as a business analyst? So I'm assuming she's are you saying you're currently a business analyst? I'm assuming is that correct? OK, no, so you're an operations specialist, so you want to become a business analyst, I'm assuming. OK. OK, yep, she says yes. So any insight, um, Monica Alfonso? Yeah, I, I and it goes back into one of the points in the presentation about thinking of how to connect the use of data to decision making that adds value to the organization. I think in terms of business analytics, that is the main uh, uh, skill that you need. You need to be able to translate and communicate effectively the results and what you're seeing in a graph or what you're seeing in a projection to the management to, to say, well, this is what happens with these decisions. This is what happens with the different scenarios. So if you find a way to, to link 
uh, your skills to that ability to communicate the projects, I think that's that's very effective. If you have SQL, if you have Python, you you are already past the main barrier, the main technical barrier, and then the business analytics is going to ask you for that, the link between uh, uh, the, the the data and the management decisions. Cool. Alice says uh, thank you. Absolutely. Um, so it looks like someone else is typing a question in the chat as well. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who, um, you know, uh, also are able to uh, unmute your mic, that's also completely fine. Feel free to speak up. You know, we are not afraid of hearing your voice. <laughs> OK, so Suraj asks a technical question. R or Python, which one is more widely used? Uh, Python, especially in tech industry, uh, even if in the statistics, like for me personally, I use R more, but more because I'm from the statistics uh, perspective. But in tech, it's, I would say, uh, two to one Python. Yeah, I also think um, just to add a little extra detail, I think Python is so versatile. Um, you can do, um, you know, more web development with Python as well as the data analytics. So I think you can, if you know Python, you can definitely, you know, forge your way through this tech industry because there's a lot of openings for for Python developers and um, data scientists that can use the know Python. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so I just thank you. You're very welcome. Cool. Uh, anyone else? Any questions, career insights, feedback? Uh, we'd love to hear, you know, uh, where you guys are on your path and how we can help you out. OK, so I'm going to leave I'm going to leave the chat open in case anyone has any more questions. Um, OK, so OK, so this is a great question from Joe. Uh, any advice on dealing with a resume gap? Um, I would just say be as honest as you can about that gap in your resume, um, depending on what it is. Um, you can share it with us or you can. I mean, Google. Um, I went, I, I had a gap in my employment due to something and they'll have a, a diplomatic way for you. In some other places, so don't be scared of that gap in your resume. Um, when it comes to tech, if you have the skills, you you'll be sought after. So um, those little things like that, it doesn't matter if you worked at Taco Bell for 12 years, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of things that um, don't matter if you get that skill set. So just focus on gaining those skills and the rest you can sort out as you go along. Yeah, I, I second that. I think just being open about what is the gap and having an explanation that people can understand. I think as uh, seeing it from the eyes of the employer, sometimes we see the CVs and you just don't know what, what is there. And so that uncertainty is what gives you a concern and then you will bring up the question in the interview. But if you have an explanation, then it's like, oh, okay, cool. And then we can move on. But it is from the employer's perspective, it is the uncertainty of not knowing what is that five year uh, blank space on your on your CV. But yeah, again, if you have an explanation and openness, then you can just get past that and it's all about the skills and the link and the fitness with the job. Awesome, so Joe says, thank you. It's very encouraging. Yeah, awesome. Oh, cool. Anyone else? Floor is open for everyone for uh, any types of questions that you guys have. Uh, any advice that you're seeking out? Um, now is the time to kind of pick our brains.
OK, so I'm going to leave the chat open uh, in case anyone has any last minute questions. Feel free to also unmute and ask or raise your hand as well. Um, but um, you know that pretty much brings us to the end of our workshop. I'm going to post uh, a couple of links in the chat. Um, for those of you who joined in late and um, weren't available to hear about this earlier, uh, we do offer 100% free one on one career coaching mentorship sessions. And this is basically to help you guys figure out uh, your ideal tech career path and we take into account everything your uh, past work experience educational history skill set uh, interests uh, you know career long-term outlook aspirations everything so um, i'm posting the link to that in the chat right now and you can go to this link <clears throat> and you can schedule your 100 percent free uh, consultation session with us um, Aside from that, that's uh, all that I have for you guys. I just want to take a moment and thank um, Alfonso and Monica very much. Uh, it's just in case you guys don't know, Alfonso and Monica are both uh, two of our newest team members here at Scalespire, and they both come with um, a lot of great experience and background. And uh, it was great to, this is actually the first time I'm speaking live with either one of them. So <laughs> we communicated via email. This is the first time um, I'm live with them. So uh, it's a, <clears throat> oh, sorry. So, so Siraj, just to answer your question, could you share the recording class presentation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who want the recording of the presentation, um, just enter your email into the chat and I will follow up with you afterwards uh, with recording. Um, <clears throat> but like I was saying, you know, I thank Alfonso and Monica very much for uh, the presentation and for being so thorough and for answering uh, all of your questions. Um, and uh, it was a pleasure. It was a great pleasure to meet you guys. And um, uh, for those of you in attendance, you know, um, you know, if you are interested in being mentored by us and taught by us, um, Alfonso and Monica are probably going to be two people you'll be, uh, you know, going back and forth with and being taught by a lot, and they're going to be instrumental in your success. So, um, okay, Suraj, thank you for the email, Suraj. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys very much. Um, that's all that I have. Uh, Monica and uh, Alfonso, do you guys have any last comment, last minute comments that you guys wanted to make for anyone um, in terms of advice, whatever it might be? Um, I'll be reaching out to uh, if you left your email here, I'll be reaching out to you next week. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, have your questions ready for me um, and I look forward to working with you all. Yeah, and same. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for, for being here for your questions. I, I don't think I can see your emails in the in the chat, but if you folks uh, uh, LinkedIn or Google or anything, uh, my email or, or, or maybe Faiz can, can share it or anything. Feel free to just reach out. Uh, most of us are very enthusiastic about this topic, so we'll, we'll be happy just to, to go to talk about them and go over any any inquiries or any uh, uh, situations that you have. We'll be we'll be happy and we'll be in touch. Awesome, absolutely. So if anyone is interested in linking up with Alfonso or Monica, whether it be um, via LinkedIn, or email, whatever it might be. Um, I'm putting my email into the chat and any questions that you have that have to do with any of our instructors or mentors or uh, any question, whatever it may be, uh, just feel free to reach out to me and I will link you up with the correct resource um, that is applicable for your situation. Um, so I just put in my email in the chat um, and I welcome you guys. Just feel free to reach out and I'll more than happy to help you guys out however I can. Uh, Monica also put her email in the chat as well. Um, I'll put Yasmin's email in the chat as well. And you guys can feel free to reach out to any one of us and we will direct you in the right direction. Um, but, you know, as for this workshop, I thank you guys very much for joining us on um, this Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys going forward. And, um, you know, I wish you the best of luck in your tech career journey, your aspirations, and I hope you guys are successful in whatever you uh, do. So thanks a lot, guys. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I hope you guys have an amazing weekend.
And I see that we still have a few people here. So if you, if anyone's still here and still has some questions, um, you know, feel free to post in the chat. Or if you just want to hang out, I guess that's also cool. But I'll be leaving soon, so you'll probably be alone in here. <laughs> Joe, did you have any last minute questions? OK, so it looks like everyone is has left. Um, let me see if Yasmin might want to join and just uh, do like a quick recap. Hey, I'm going to grab my charger. I'll be right back. Sure, no problem. One second. Alfonso, I thought you had some really great information on your slides, stuff I didn't even know. So I thought that was good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I uh, this this was a uh, Fais. Uh, he sent me the 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 slides, and I made a few adjustments just for things that I I knew I handled better. I would feel more comfortable going over. But yeah, it's mostly from from whatever whatever I got. Uh, hope hope it uh, it went well. Okay, good. Yeah, great presentation, Alfonso, and I appreciate Monica also coming in and being able to answer questions and uh, help people out. So it was, I thought it was a great, uh, great workshop. Um, so I asked Yasmin to kind of join in and give a quick recap, but I think she might be busy, so I don't want to keep you guys here for too long, especially on a Saturday. Um, yeah, I, you know, I just want to thank you guys very much. I know it's the first time either or any three of us have linked up with any one of each other, I think. So uh, it's, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Um, and uh, I know Monica, I'll be working closely with you going forward, I think, um, you know, to uh, help us sort of uh, warm up our leads and create a flow for uh, helping them, you know, in their uh, tech career path. So, um, and Alfonso, I probably won't be as much in contact with you because you're more of an, you're an instructor. So um, you probably have more contact with Yasmin and Terry, but it was a pleasure to meet you as well. So um, if there's any way I can help out uh, with you guys, please feel free to let me know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was great to meet you guys. And, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Great. Thank you so much. And yeah, it's, it's great to meet you too. Uh, and hope, hope to uh, see you and hear more of you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. All right, I'll have you on Monday. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> mm.